Another thing that will increase the variety that exists in the population and therefore leads to evolution is the idea of mutations. Now mutations are changes in either the structure or sequence of the DNA code. And there can be either chromosome mutations or gene mutations. Here you see some examples of chromosome mutations which involve the deletion or duplication or inversion of pieces in the chromosome or the translocations from pieces from one chromosome to another chromosome that's not necessarily its homologous pair. And you can either do that as a, as a balanced translocation or an unbalanced translocation, and they're just sometimes called as an insertion. And these changes will cause changes in the phenotype. You see here an example of the different shapes of, of wings for flies because of mutations that occur in the, in the genotype of these flies. And you have all different kinds of looks, just like there's so many different looks in the human skin color, so many different looks because of the development of these paralogous or home, home, or hortholagous genes that will dominate the genome. If you did the taxonomy lecture series, you know what I'm talking about. All of this variety that exists in life is because of mutations. But the effect of mutations is going to be very, very different. You know, chromosomal mutations usually will change a lot of the phenotype because it will affect multiple genes all at the same time. And duplication is going to be very important to develop the orthologous genes or the idea of multiple copies of the same gene across the genome. And things like deletions, inversions, insertions are also going to be important to create new kinds of genes, uh, which will may lead to speciation, especially if you change the chromosomes enough that two different uh, people can no longer have children together because they have chromosomal differences which are substantial, causing the uh, zygote to not be viable if you actually try to cross two people. So, for example, us and gorillas cannot make a viable baby because we have a different number of chromosomes. So, and now these yes, also have mutations such as gene mutations. This is an insertion that they're showing over here, which shifts the entire code to the right. So it's also called a frame shift mutation because you add an A and then the entire code shifts and therefore all the amino acids after that insertion will be different. You also have a deletion, which does the same by removing a gene and it also causes a frame shift, which will also change the amino acids. And deletions and insertions will usually create major uh, missense or, or sometimes nonsense mutations. And or unless they happen very, very late into the genetic code, so they only affect a very few bases of, of the protein. But you also have repeat expansions when you actually add another nucleotide codon series uh, to expand the, the protein, basically. And you also have substitutions when you change only one single uh, gene in the sequence and sometimes a substitution that makes no difference because of the wobble sometimes it changes things significantly and it will cause uh, major changes now here's an example, as an example of a substitution that leads to a missense mutation because in terms of genetics uh, mutations could be either nonsense missense or silent now silent mutations will be when you don't change the code at all you know we'll talk about that in a second but missense mutations when you, when you change the code a little bit uh, either because of the uh, you just change one amino acid or because you change the amino acid very at the end of the sequence of the protein. So it's, it won't affect the protein too much. So you make a different protein, but you still make a protein. Like a nonsense mutation, though, is when you change the protein so much that it's no longer functional or when you actually cause early termination or fail to the protein to initiate because you've mutated it create a new stop codon or, or change the start codon so that the protein is no longer functional at all because it's too short or doesn't even start. Those are called nonsense mutations because you don't make any protein at all. An example of a missense mutation would be like the B type on the blood types because it changed the A type. And the O type would be an example of a nonsense mutation because you no longer have the surface protein in the surface of the red blood cells. All right? So, and you also have the silent mutations. Now, silent mutations are mutations that might be present in, but not necessarily uh, sh shown in a population. And there's a lot of reasons why this could be the case. One of the reasons is the fact that the mRNA code has what it called uh, ambiguity, that it's possible to, to write the same uh, code message with different kinds of changes. For example, if you see, see you here, if you send the, change the ACC and the DNA code to AAG, you're going to change the mRNA code, but both codes stand for, 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 P, for phenylalanine, so you're not going to actually change the protein that's based on that code. So that's what we call the wobble effect. There are other reasons why some, sometimes the code changes and doesn't change the phenotype. Sometimes it, it will happen, the mutation will happen in a non-coding region of the DNA, which will, of course, not be shown as, as the protein's product because it's not coding for any proteins, it's just junk DNA. And that includes uh, mutations that occur in the introns that end up being removed anyways from the genetic code. And so they're not going to necessarily affect the change unless, of course, the mutation happens right at the boundary of the intron, which is called the intron boundary sequence. And then the spliceosomes, which are in 
charge of removing those introns will no longer be able to recognize them and they will fail to remove them. And then that's going to change the protein because it's going to leave that intron there instead of taking mm -hmm. it out like, like it's supposed to. You also have mutations which are so going to be silent because uh, they're going to be masked by the dominant by the, the dominant gene. So you, you have things like diplody occurring. So you have to, if you have a heterozygous and the gene is recessive, it will not be shown even though it's present because the dominant gene will mask the effect of the recessive gene. So diplody also uh, will reduce the amount of, of expression of certain genes. So the, the trait would be there but carried only. It will be silent in a person, and which means the person can pass it on without necessarily even realizing that it has. Another thing that will cause silent mutations are things like the environment, which will be uh, deactivating a certain gene that should be around because of uh, relationships called epigenetics. Sometimes also epistasis effects, which are one gene affecting another, or multifactorial traits, which is a trait that depends on many genes, will also mask the effect of one single mutant gene might not necessarily make that much of a difference. So you see a lot of things will play into whether or not a mutation will actually be seen in a population. And even if seen, it's going to be depend on where it happens. If the mutation happens in a somatic cell, in other words, a body cell that's of the adult, and it's not going to be passed on to the next generation. It may cause things like cancer and other problems for the person who has a mutation, but it will not be passed on or cause any evolutionary effect or any family syndrome. But mutations that happen in the germline cells or during meiosis or during the, the creation of gamete cells, those will actually be passed on to the next generation and will cause problems for the offspring or actually cause benefits for the offspring. And that's a whole different story. Now, they also may cause things like cancer. They also might cause several disorders, but sometimes they might be beneficial. And then goes the idea of mutation, looking at it from an evolutionary point of view. Some mutations will actually provide advantages to organisms and we'll call adaptations which will make the organism more likely to survive we did examples about that when we talk about the beaks of the finches in darwin's uh, um, galapagos Island studies we also talked about sometimes our coloration or all kinds of different phys phys physical adaptations will cause advantages for organisms and across many generations they will become more common in populations as selection selects against a look that has less advantageous since the people who have advantageous looks will have more children that survive to have more children and will typically live longer lives because they're not going to be predated upon as much or are going to be actually catching more prey or whatever your, your niche on the environment is going to be it's going to be actually better at being completing the niche because you have a better set of adaptations and that's what we call beneficial mutations or adaptations but there's also deleterious mutations and among the mutations which are not silent the majority of them are going to be deleterious because they're going to cause changes which typically are going to be bad for the for the animal and a lot of times the organism doesn't even make past the embryonic stage because uh, the mutation will cause failure to the embryo to actually complete and so you don't even see these mutations happening a lot more mutations happen than you realize because the majority of them actually gets deleted before it even becomes a phenotype because uh, selection selects against them the embryo basically does not survive there's also new mutations and those are the ones that actually evolve very very quickly because they can change over and over again without either being advantageous or disadvantageous so they're actually going to change a lot and so when we do a clocking we look at the non-coding regions or regions which cause new mutations to actually uh, look at fast evolving traits because neutral mutations are mutations which change your looks but do not make any difference for evolution it's kind of like something that you know whether you have it or not it won't make a difference like for example and before if you had appendicitis you will most likely die uh, be before for the disease but now we have modern medicine which treats this and as long as you ca catch it on time and you have a good doctor and now there are no complications you actually going to be surviving that so it's almost neutral of course there's always a greater chance of somebody who gets appendicitis of dying to somebody who doesn't so a smaller appendix may just be advantageous uh, and therefore it is kind of a, having a deleterious mutation to be the wild type with a longer uh, appendix so over time the appendix should disappear unless it actually performs some sort of function and we think there may have been some sort of vestigial function for the appendix and that's why it's still around otherwise it would be selected again by now although of course the fact that most people that get appendicitis get it at a later time in their lives and therefore they already must have had babies or could have already had babies means they already passed those genes anyways so 
uh, genes with uh, with a bigger appendix or anything that makes the appendix more likely to have the have uh, infection will not necessarily be deleted from the population because it's not necessarily deleterious enough for that to happen. And that's why some vestigial structures are left there because they're not necessarily going to be bad or bad enough to be deleted or, or be replaced by something that's beneficial. Now. The, the effect of mutations in the population are going to be dependent on a lot of things. First of all, if the population is very large, it's going to take a long time for enough mutations together for them to be perceived at the population level. In other words, to affect the allele frequency. So mutations are not going to be uh, having any kind of short-term effect. It will change only that specific person. And it will, until that person passes that genes on, it won't make that much big of a difference. Now. Uh, the immediate effect of mutations are very, very small, and it will take many, many generations and successive continuous mutations towards a certain type of allele for enough mutations to gather to, for you to actually see an effect. So mutations alone are not going to actually do this. But if the population is small and there is enough selection towards a certain mutation, then the long-term effect on the pop mutation population is um, um, uh, impossible to deny. The mutations will actually cause, when beneficial, new changes in the looks that will cause uh, species to evolve and create more variety over time, especially when you throw in sexual reproduction, which jumbles those genes around and makes it possible for mutations that uh, may not have been advantageous to be mixed up with mutations which are. And we'll talk more about that later in the lecture series. But either way, mutations are going to be the source of variation and therefore very important for macroevolution. And there's some types of advanced math that you can actually do to calculate the effect of mutations or how long it would last for a di different mutation to actually take hold of the population. But just to put things in perspective, it would take over almost a million generations for mutations alone without selection or gene flow or genetic drift or any of the other kinds of microevolution mechanisms to actually cause mutations to change the phenotype significantly to the point that you actually get to like a homogenized population with half of mutants, half non-mutant populations. In other words, mutations alone would not actually cause an effect over a feasible history of time. But, it, but selection and gene flow and genetic drift will cause these changes to actually take place. And we'll talk more about how factors act together at the end of this series of videos.